we've got a formidable panel here. Uh, it's really all about passion, isn't it? Passion to do this better and better and include more and more people. But um, some terrific insights, some provocative comments, um, and next 15 minutes or so, we've got to um, have a bit of an exchange about all this. So um, hopefully you've thought up some questions to exploit this opportunity. We have so much expertise here to get involved in the debate. So who would like to kick off with a question to our eminent panel? Yes, that gentleman in the blue there. If you can scale up this learning, how do you engage with 7,000 students on a forum? 7,000 people inputting information. I'm in a tutor group forum with 20, and I look at it and I sometimes think, I haven't been on for three days and there's 60 more contributions. <laughs> and I've got other things to do. Which one's important? So it's a very good question. It's one that Future Learn has been grappling with because we um, have a very limited number of educators and facilitators for each course. The starting point was to say, let's not fret about it. Let's not try to answer every question, to respond to every comment. So the main way of interacting is a kind of water cooler conversation that just flows past. Sometimes, you know, there are some of the pieces of content have over 15,000 comments. So there's no way you can respond to them. But what happens as a student, as a learner, is that you watch this go past. Some of them look interesting, and you then click and respond to them. Some of them you just say that you like and that these comments as they go past c collect likes because there are many tens of thousands of people engaging um, with this same course. And then typically you would read some of them that are most current. You'd also read the most liked. As an educator, as a facilitator, you would look at some of the most liked comments and you'd maybe add your um, response to those. Because um, both the educators and the learners can be followed, then you will see other students who will be looking at the educator's response, who will go then to the most liked comment and look at that comment. And so you will get learner-constructed threads rather than um, initially devised threads. So you do get these sorts of clusters and threads of conversation, but not in the typical kind of forum threaded conversation way. And then there are more structured conversations that you can have. Um, and one thing that Future Learn is then going to develop in the future is small group um, discussions as well. So it's only part of the conversational space. But we really didn't know whether these sorts of flowing water cooler conversations would work because they're very different to the traditional forums and threaded discussions. And they do, but they take some getting used to, particularly you know, as you watch these conversations flow past. Any other comments on that one? No, we'll move on. I've got a question here that's come in from Facebook, from Melody. How can we use technology to improve student engagement and learning during group online discussions? Peter, would you like to take that one? Well, kind of following on from the last question, I think one of the things that we get hung up on is trying to be too much in control of online sessions and trying to, you know, student ask a question, you want to answer the question. Um, because it's very easy for uh, people in education to teach. Um, and one of the best things you can do, which we invest quite a lot on in the OU in thinking about, is trying to get the students to um, facilitate their own discussion, work with themselves, work as peers on things. So what, what, what we're always trying to do in our learning designs is create opportunities for the students to do creative work together. So I think when we're looking at the sorts of forms of learning design, whatever space we're looking at, we're looking at ways to try and create opportunities for students to work together rather than to be you know, working entirely on our agenda. I mean, I think a, a way that we can connect into that kind of thought uh, is, comes out of the work that Mike and I have been doing on inquiry learning because one of the ways in which students, we think, become more engaged in uh, what they're trying to find out is if they have a role in shaping the inquiry that they're, they're working. It's certainly been our experience in the school-based projects that the kind of motivation and appreciation of the role that science can play in your life is vastly increased by 
trying to answer a question that you really want to know the answer to rather than something your teacher thinks you need to know the answer <laughs> to. And I think some of that kind of uh, personal uh, curiosity about what you're working on, that can be shaped into group online discussion. I mean, I, I can think of some master's courses where we have, have, have in a way, artificially created a co the kind of conversational space that Mike's talking about by uh, setting group work, by letting students decide on the particular question that they're going to answer from a set of data and then really be in control of the process of engaging with other people on that. So I think there are th lots of things about the activity design <laughs> that we know something about that we could work more on. There's so much free stuff out there, which is amazing to use. I'm teaching a course at the moment on digital cultures. And one of the things we're doing, there's a, a, a free web-based thing called TogetherTube, which pulls a video from YouTube um, into a space with a little chat room next to it. Um, and so we're running a film festival just using this, this, this technology. And it's really basic, it's really easy, it's really quick. But we can line up films, stream them in, and just have a chat of an evening kind of mm. as, as we watch the films together as a group. And it's, it's, it's a really nice kind of simple pedagogy. So do more of that, I think. Yes, please. So uh, I like the idea of facilitating their own learning. But can they fac facilitate assessment? <laughs> yeah, a bit stuck there, but apparently Eileen's got the answer, so I'm sure <laughs> that. it's okay. I, I can relax. So. It can certainly, it can certainly do more to harness students' creativity into the assessment process. I think the reason I took, uh, um, not Umbridge, but I took uh, Peter on in this comment was because if what he said was true. We have to engage with that because we know that the single thing that drives student learning in any formal education system is potential success around assessment. So whether he's right or I'm right, assessment is supremely important. Therefore, either we think of creative ways to do it, and my, my, uh, the things that I've come across particularly focus on um, collaborative learning, on production of interesting artifacts, not, you know, pencil and paper answers to questions that you you could Google the answer to if you were had allowed to do that in the exam room. So the notion of assessment being done on products of your learning that you care about seems to me to and I think that we've seen some examples of how technology can help with that co creation of artifacts that you might care about. I think that's the way that I see technology moving the, the goalposts of it for what might be more interesting um, assessment. But you don't agree? No, I, I, I kind of do. I mean, to be honest, it's a provocative question, right? I was trying to stimulate a bit of thinking because actually I, I, it's a fake question because um, I, I was thinking as I wrote it, I don't think technology is the answer. I think the answer is what it is we're trying to do, mm. not just the technologies that we can use to solve the problem. Because in a sense, if you can't let the student Google the answer, and that's a good answer, then it's a fake examination, because that's the real life for mm. all of us. Um, so actually, we set up a lot of fake situations where we're really testing recall, really yeah. testing a false competence in a skill that a student doesn't need. Um, and that seems to me a, a dilemma, but it's not to do with technology, it's to do with mm. what we're trying to measure mm. and what we're trying to create in the student. So in a sense, we're saying, can you create experiences for the student to perform where they're creating something of their own? Um, uh, a really effective um, uh, film festival that the students have co-created together would be a fabulous assessment because mm. they've built something that achieves whatever the educational goal was. And just yeah. to add to that one, area that we were looking at is not only students creating artifacts but then curating them yeah. so the, it, with the inquiry system you can create a mission it's very easy to do that um, 
but then you need to curate it. You need to get other people to join it. Uh, you need to engage them in the conversation. You mm -hmm. need to show why that mission is important. You need to get them to like it. So the artifact that you create is only just a starting point. And I think that's a new and interesting aspect of, uh, of evaluation and assessment where you produce something, but then you've got to make it work. You've got to curate it over a period of time. Yes. Um, this question was sparked, I guess, initially by the comments about FutureLearn and the stream of comments and how, how you facilitate those and people going towards the most liked ones, mm. etc. But I think it also relates to assessment. In, in, for me in FutureLearn, the comments and responses and likes feels like assessment and, you know, I comment and I... Mm -hmm. um, how, what can you do, what more can you do to direct uh, facilitators and students attention towards those students that are making comments and not being liked mm -hmm. can you manipulate behavior through the interface so that you can help those people become more integrated in the I think it's a, it's a really interesting question that because the danger in any sort of conversational forum is that the person who speaks loudest or the person who speaks most frequently or the person who speaks most articulately is the one who then gets the approbation, who then gets the reward. So um, how can you enable people whose voices are small, but nevertheless important? I think there are a number of ways we can do that. Uh, and in Future Learn, one of the areas that I'm interested in is in small group discussions, so that you can allow people to go from the, trying to solve a problem individually to solving a problem in a small group where every voice needs to be heard in that small group, and then you share it in a wider space. Uh, and I think there are opportunities there, and particularly of that moving from the individual to the group, where you can uh, have different dynamics, and you can let the small voices be heard, where you perhaps can't in a larger space. OK, uh, another question that's coming from Facebook here. Uh, do you feel that online tutorials provide the same level of teaching and learning is face-to-face. -face. Eileen, do you want to have a go at that? I'll have a go. Um, I think they can do a lot of the same things. I think, I think one of the things that we've always tried to do at the Open University is analyse um, what's required in a particular situation. In the early uh, uh, attempts to teach science, we had to look at what experimental work or lab experience you know, boil it down to the key things that needed to be delivered at a distance. So I think, um, I think that, I mean, I've done uh, work as an AL myself. I certainly enjoy face-to-face -face tuition, but I've also worked with online groups at master's level, where I think in some ways, um, the, the in some ways I can think of ways in which the experience is actually slightly more um, capturable. You know, the, the fact that the, you can record what other people are saying and also potentially if you do it asynchronously, take time to consider your responses to a group. As Mike says, you know, in face-to-face, -face, we've all been in face-to-face -face tutorials where somebody has the, the uh, loudest voice and takes most time at it. I think there are potentially there are ways that online tuition can be a bit more equitable. What do you think? Sean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, think it's, I don't think that's so much a media issue as a, as a kind of a teaching issue, um, if you like. I think c community and contact drive good teaching. It doesn't really matter how that teaching is mediated as long as there's, there is a sense of community and there is a sense of responsiveness and contact with teachers. And I think, I mean, s s some of the, the people coming off our distance programmes say, well, I've had a more intimate <laughs> and more responsive experience than I ever had in on, on campus. So I think it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a question about media, it's a question about context and teaching. Yeah, so and you, in fact, you've obviously been given, giving a lot of thought at Edinburgh to how the student experience itself can be improved through online interaction. I mean, is that, can you, could you say a little bit more about that in terms of students across the globe who are having the Edinburgh experience? Um, I think it's, it's about having a commitment to 
a, a quality of teaching which is exactly the same as the quality of teaching that you would, that students would get on campus. Um, it's just differently mediated. So it's about having, you know, I don't need to tell you you this. <laughs> you know, you know this, but you know, well-staffed courses with you know responsive teachers, learning and, and teaching designs that. Um, encourage community and set up structures that enable community to form um, among sort of globally distributed learners. It's, um, it, it's that kind of commitment to high quality course design and to high quality teaching input. Peter? I was just going to say, <coughs> um, I, I wouldn't be defensive about it in, in saying that I think the online has the ability to be significantly better than the face to face. And I think there's lots of very good evidence that the things that you can do online allow you to do so much more than you can do when you're locked into a physical space. But it, that's, that's to do with the nature of the technology and what's possible. The key is, of course, not those things. The key is what you're trying to do in the event. So it's the design of the event and the, the learning design around that that makes it successful or not successful. So a tutorial can be a bad tutorial because it's designed badly, regardless of where it is. But with respect to the potential, I don't think there's any doubt that online is significantly more powerful. So put those together in creative ways as they're trying to do in Edinburgh and other places. You have some, some really exciting things. And, and of course, we do that as well. We don't just do online. We, we do physical too. Right. Anybody else from the floor? Yes, please. Go. Yeah, there's a mic on its way to you. Thank you. I realise that we've talked primarily about adult learning um, and higher education learning, but um, I, the, in the video you showed that you w have worked with younger children, and I do a lot of work with younger children, so how do you think that the, the technological learning and using technology and distance learning with younger people, how does that, does it, is it different? Eileen? Um, Mike's going to start, uh, okay. and I'll join in. Okay, so on, on Thursday, I'm going to the BET show, which is the largest trade show for education technology in the world. I'm going to be on the Samsung stand there and uh, going to be talking about apps in education. And um, one of the huge opportunities is uh, for one-to-one -one learning. So it's something that we've been wanting to do for the last 20 years or so to allow every child in a classroom to have their own personal learning environment but not just that they can use in the classroom, but they can use between classroom and home or classroom and outside. The idea of connecting informal and formal learning. That's what we were trying to do with the Inquire project. Um, that's what we did uh, with an earlier project with museum learning. One of the big problems <coughs> on museum trips for children is that they're not adequately prepared. And then when they go on the trip, there's nothing really they can take back apart from a worksheet. So we looked at the ways in which we could connect those spaces together. And I think that's the huge opportunity at a younger level, is to provide your personal learning environment, which you can not only just have in one space, but you can move between spaces. So you can have that mobility as a learner uh, around your personal technology. Right. Uh, and I have to say that, um, one of the things that we were most pleased with in the personal inquiry project where the, the uh, uh, video came from, uh, as at, the, at the point that we got the money to do the project, um, people said, oh, you'll have terrible trouble getting into classrooms mm -hmm. and doing things because teachers won't want to use technology. It'll be too complicated or time consuming. The opposite was the case. You know, if we people bit our hands off, uh, it, to be part of the project. I vividly remember in a local school, we went for our first pilot. We, we were looking for 10 students to do something with to test out our technology. And an hour later, we came out of the school uh, having responsibility for the technology to support 78 GCSE geography projects which was a bit of a face, <laughs> but that was, to me, it was really uh, brought home to me the appetite for using technology in interesting ways in schools. One very quick last question, and I think you are it there. Hi, it, it might be a bit of a provocative question, but uh, if online tutorials can be better, than face-to-face, -face. and if Edinburgh can teach people all over the world, 
Why do we need campuses? Quick, quick answer from each of you. Go round. So we'll start. Uh, it sounded with like it was a question to Sean. Why Sean. do you need campuses? <laughs> <laughs> While Peter's thinking about it. Um, I, I think I think we, we, we it, it's dangerous to underestimate the the, the kind of um, the, the richness of bodies, warm bodies in spaces. And, you know, I think that that's that's important. But we're not talking about an either or decision, an, an either or choice here. I mean, I think as Peter mentioned earlier, we can have really good online teaching and we can have really good on-campus teaching, and both work really well if they're done really well. So that would have been my answer too. Exactly. <laughs> right. Mike. Um, I'm glad we're all here now because we've got a, a, you know, a group warm of warm bodies, bodies together. Warm bodies. <laughs> That's right. And yes. th th there are obvious advantages, not least in celebration of bringing people together. But I think, there's an, I think part of the... Uh, Sean asked us a question that we didn't respond to, whether there would be similar kind of findings on a project if we tried to look at what the, what the spaces of distance education are at the Open University. And I think some, I think it would be really interesting to do because I think there are maybe, uh, certainly in the early years, the open days on campus were really important for students to come to. They really wanted to come here. They wanted to know what Milton Keynes was like. They wanted to see Walton Hall. But there are other sorts of things like the ident uh, that was always played before a university television program that link people to the notion of a, a place or a space or whatever that they are connected to in this open university community. And I think it'd be fascinating to try and map some of the similarities and differences across the two institutions. Do take the opportunity to have more informal discussion with our panel. Thank you very much for coming along tonight and those of you who've joined us virtually and particularly thanks to our panel who I think have done a tremendous job for us tonight so if we could thank them in the usual way. Thank you.